Spirit and Truth, I'm Pastor Todd Kleppe with Rivers of Living Water Ministry. And I'm Pastor Nick Tognetti with Revelation Church. And today we're going we're gonna to drink some coffee and have a conversation. Yeah, today we're going to talk a little bit about Lot from the book of Genesis. In the New Testament, we have a little bit of insight that we don't get so on the surface that we get in the book of Genesis. And so we want to talk a little bit about learning about who Lot was, and how to learn a little bit more than, say, what we get in the narrative of whenever he was in Sodom. And so we'll start out in 2 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 7. And actually, you know what? We'll start in verse 5. It says, And if God did not spare the former world, but preserved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, when he brought a flood on the world of the wicked and burned up the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and condemned them by an overthrow, making them a demonstration to the wicked who should come after them, and also delivered righteous Lot, who was tormented with the filthy conduct of the Torahless, or of the lawless. For that upright man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing from day to day was distressed in his righteous soul by their lawless deeds. The Lord knows how to rescue from afflictions those who fear him, and he will reserve the wicked for the day of judgment to be anguished. And so the interesting thing here is that Peter says very clearly, in fact, he says it twice just in those verses, that Lot's righteous. Yeah. Yet in the book of Genesis, we don't get to see a whole lot of Things, especially with Sodom and Gomorrah, of him being, say, righteous. In fact, about five chapters earlier, six chapters earlier in Genesis 13 and 14, we actually have very strong reason to believe that whenever he and Abraham split up for the first time, it was splitting up because somewhat of a selfish greed on Lot's part. Yeah. But then he gets saved by Abraham. And then a little bit later in Genesis 19, we see him in, in Sodom. But here, clearly, he's called righteous, at least in Sodom. We, we won't speak before that, but so, so what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think, I think before we go too far into this, we need to define what, is, what does righteous mean. Uh, and because without that definition, um, p- people aren't going to understand exactly what it means to be righteous. Because as we know with Noah, he was called the righteous of all generations. Um, from Abraham down. And when you think about that, when you see a timeline, people don't always realize, a lot of times I'll leave out here a timeline that shows from Adam all the way the the length of life. And the first time I saw that, I remember looking at that going, wait a second, Adam was alive all the way up to Lamech, Noah's father. And you have uh, Methuselah in there who lived to be 969 years or whatever it was, 900, I don't remember the exact number, but it was over 900 years. Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah. So out of all of these people, Enoch, we know, was very righteous because he was taken he was up taken. without even dying. Yep. So he, he made it into the Hall of Faith. Exactly. Him and Elijah both. Yeah. But so what does it mean to be righteous? Well, I think that that's a good point. And so if we look at the very first time that this word is used, it's mm-hmm. actually used with Noah. Right. As you were just saying. So it says in, in Genesis 6, 9, it says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah, a righteous man, perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. Now, here's, here's the thing, is that when it says Noah's a righteous man, it says in Genesis 6, 9, Noah, ish tzaddik tamim hayabador tov. So it says that he's righteous, but then it gives a description of why he's righteous, and it calls him tamim. There you go. And this word tamim, I've, I've said before, in my opinion, is the most important word in the entire Torah apart from the, the term the Messiah. Yeah. And the reason being is because it's actually referenced all throughout the New Testament whenever Paul is talking about being blameless or without blemish. This is the same word that the offerings were without blemish. And so this word tamim, it 
it can mean without blemish. We can interpret it as that given the context of, of those passages. But what it literally means is to be filled with integrity. It means to be perfect. It means to be complete. And it means to be devout. And so Noah was considered a righteous man here because of, number one, his faith. Yeah. He was saved by faith. He, he, because of his faith, he went and built the ark. But because of his devotion, it says he was tamim in his generation, meaning all of the sins of his generation, you couldn't see that on him. No. He was different. No. And so therefore he shined as a light in this world in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation like Paul says. And then obviously, like I said, the very first and foremost thing that we have to recognize being believers in Messiah is that it comes first through our faith and because of what he did for us. Right. And and he was looked he was looked at in in that society at the time by others. They also veered him as somebody with a high standard in, in society as well. Yeah. That word to me is very powerful. And it separates because I've heard people talk about before what was in his DNA. Well, that DNA, according to the word, comes from Adam and Eve all the way down to everybody. So there's, if you want to say that, then all of us have a little bit of the ability to have that, especially through Yeshua. But my point is this. It's the fact that he chose. Amen. And we have a choice in our daily walk. Are we going to, every day, are we going to walk with him or are we going to do it our way? Well, and that's, and, and so what you just said, you know, explains Noah. It says, Eta Elohim hitalech Noach. Noach walked with God. And what you just said, are we going to choose him every day? It's amazing you said that because he talech, to walk, in, in biblical Hebrew grammar, it's what we call the heat pa'el form. And when it comes to something in the physical, what it actually means is a repetitive action. It's called iterative in biblical Hebrew grammar. So what it literally means is it's not that Noah walked with God. It's that Noah continually walked with God. It wasn't, oh, today I feel like it, tomorrow I don't, so right. on and so forth. So this devotion to the Lord and this faith, first and foremost, this faith and this devotion to the Lord is what caused him to be righteous, which now brings us, like you were saying, to define these terms for Lot, being why is he, why is he seen as righteous, okay? Um, especially when we get to see the, the fallout, if you will, between he and Abraham. But also what's interesting is that it says in Genesis 19, it says, because of the prayer of Abraham, he saved Lot. Mm -hmm. And so it's like no matter how righteous he was, there was still another advocate for him. Yes. The same way with us, it's like no matter what we do, we need the advocate. We need Yeshua. Well, you know, there's a, there's a saying out there that says that birds of a feather flock together. Or you become like those you associate with. Yeah. In Lot's, in Lot's example, he associated with his, his uncle. And he went with his uncle. He followed his uncle. He learned uh, the ways of, of Abraham. Yeah. And the fact that the father was speaking to him in such a powerful way. And when he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you into a land. And for him to say yes. And to witness that whole thing. Had to be very powerful for young Lot at the time. Yeah. Uh, to do that. So he had a good mentor. For sure. Well, it's, it's interesting that you say that because we see here right at the beginning of the narrative in Genesis 19 where God is going to overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. He just met with Abraham in Genesis 18. Abraham's interceding on, on uh, really on all the righteous ones' behalf that may be found in Sodom and Gomorrah. But in Genesis 19, it says, and the two angels, remember, at the beginning of Genesis 18, we have three angels, one of them being the Lord himself, yes. coming to meet with Abraham. And we have to remember what Abraham immediately does. He's <laughs> sitting in the door of his tent. Yeah. And he runs to these angels and he bows down. Yeah. Okay, well, we, and then he's obviously very hospitable to them in Genesis 18. Well, then one chapter later in Sodom and Gomorrah, one of the angels, which is the Lord, stays back with Abraham, but two of these angels go forth, and it says in Genesis 19, and the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was dwelling in the gate of Sodom, and Lot saw them, and he rose up to meet them, and he bowed down his face to the ground, and he begs them to come in. So notice that he literally does the same thing his uncle does. Yeah. And, and what's powerful about that too is the fact, okay, why was Lot sitting there in the gates? Why was he, why was he sitting at the gate? You know? We, we can 
go back into Scripture, and you can see there's others who sat at the gate, and they were watchmen. Right. Um, but at the same time, the fact that he did exactly what Abraham did right. means that he understood the presence of the Almighty. He understood the presence of angelic beings because there's a righteousness upon them. And when we experience that in our life, um, it's, we're very fortunate. And also the fact that we understand that that's a special time. So it's either a good thing or they're coming to warn you of something bad going down. Well, I think that that's a good point where you, where you mentioned why was he at the gate and you bring up him being a watchman. And I absolutely agree because what he was doing at the gate, not only what he did after the gate and, and giving, you know, and, and fighting for these angels and so on and so forth, but what he was doing at the gate, this is, this is what I, I like to see with, with the scriptures is that whenever we study the scripture, whether we're studying Noah, whether we're studying Lot, whether we're studying Adam, whether we're studying the fig tree in the Garden of Eden, um, in the stories or in those narratives in and of themselves, we don't get a ton of information. You know, okay, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But in the narrative in and of itself, we don't get to learn a lot about Noah. But if we study the linguistics, if we study key words, how it says, Noah, a righteous man in his generations, and he was tamim, he was without blemish, okay? And Noah's name, Noah, is actually short, according to Marcus Jastrow's dictionary, it's actually short for the word where we get the word pleasing aroma. So all of these descriptions point to the burnt offering. And so we can study the burnt offering, learn about Noah. We can do all these different things where we can study all these different things of Scripture to actually get more about the narrative of Noah. And the same thing happens here with Lot is what was Lot really doing at the gate? And I find it very interesting that in Proverbs chapter 1, I believe we get a very similar description yeah. where it tells us actually what Lot was doing because, as you were saying, you know, birds of a feather flock together, but here with the case of Lot, he, he rose above that situation, but his soul was being tormented, as Peter says. And it says here in Proverbs chapter 1, it says, Wisdom sings out in the street. It gives forth its voice in the squares. It cries at the head of noisy throngs. At the entrances of the gates in the city, it speaks its words. And then it says its words here. It interprets its words. It says it speaks its words. How long, O oh simpletons, will you love folly? Scoffers covet mockery for themselves and fools hate knowledge. Return to my reproof. Behold, I will express my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. And then wisdom continues to go on all the way through verse 33, yeah. saying what this is. And so it says that wisdom is sitting at the gates of the city doing this. And so it's actually telling us what Lot was doing at the gates of the city with wisdom crying out to the people of the city to repent yeah. every day. Yeah. And you know, with that too, I've been in the book of Solomon quite a bit. The Father actually had me write it down twice. And there's so many places in there where he talks about... The, the whole theme of, of, of Solomon uh, in Ecclesiastes yeah. is talking about the fear of Yah. Yeah. And that is the basis of the whole thing because everything without the fear of Yahweh is vanity. Yeah. I've, I've heard people talk about the fact, well, he was so depressed and he wrote this. No. It's one of the seven spirits. It, exactly. And the fact that what he's doing is he's saying, people, listen... You can work all your days and accumulate all this wealth, but if he's not in it and you don't fear him, it's all for vanity. And that's what he actually sums up the book of Ecclesiastes. Exactly. In. At the end, what is the all of man to keep his commandments and to fear him? Amen. But it's, it's, it's powerful because, you know, out of the seven spirits of God that are listed in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, there's only one of those seven spirits that it says, this is the Lord's treasure. In Isaiah 33, 6, the only one of the seven spirits in Isaiah 33, 6, it says the fear of the Lord is his treasure. And the reason is, is because in Jeremiah 32, 40, it says, I will put my fear in their hearts that they will not depart from me. Amen. And so the fear of the Lord is this reverence for him that keeps us so near. It keeps us away from yeah. sin. It makes sin very uncomfortable. And if you do fall into sin, it makes it so uncomfortable you can't stay there. It's just like Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, where he tells him to take, to take this uh, cloth and, and take it to the Euphrates and bury it in the bank. And then he sends him back. 
And this was a huge journey for him. This wasn't real close. I mean, this was a long journey. Yeah. He goes back, and by the time he gets there, it's, it's worthless. But he says, this will be Israel, wrapped around my waist, worthless, and they'll depend on me for everything. His whole heart is the fact that we will be in relationship with him and that we will seek him in everything that we do. Amen. But the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Amen. So back to Lot. So Lot's sitting here at the gate, and the thing I noticed, and you just talked about it, is the fact that he goes out and he bows down yeah. to these people because he knows they're angels. Now, hang on a second. They look like people. Yeah. It's and actually later on, it calls them men. Yeah, because yeah. they look like men. Yeah. There's also a verse in the Word that says, you you know, uh, you never know when you're entertaining angels. Hebrews 13, too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You never know when you're entertaining angels. Absolutely. It could be a homeless person. It could be uh, the, the person that is the most uncomely. Yep. Cashier. How about Yeshua yeah. when he was walking on the road of Emmaus? Yep. They didn't know who he was until the very end. Exactly. He, he didn't look the same. Well, and so that's an interesting point because this was actually something that you brought up the other day was it says here... It call, whenever whenever Lot comes to approach them, it calls them angels. Mm -hmm. But when the other men try to approach them, it's it's the, the scripture is kind of dressing them as, as just men. Yeah. And so whether Lot recognized that there were angels or not, for just the sake of, of this right here, we'll, we'll go with the possibility that he, he may have recognized that there were angels. Yeah. I think that there is definitely something going on in the sense that he was a righteous man and there are certain revelations that are treasured for the righteous. Daniel's a good example of that. Because remember, Daniel said that um, when the angel appeared, he fell down at his feet as well. And the other men didn't see the vision. <clears throat> they didn't see him. I believe the Father opens the eyes of the righteous to Amen. see him in the Spirit. Amen. And if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, I mean, these guys obviously were. Yeah. They had, they had it. Yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had the wisdom. They wouldn't have had to understand the seven spirits of Yah. Walking in righteousness in the midst of a crooked, can't crooked and perverse generation. No, absolutely. You can't do it. And, and I would even go on to say that these were our first apostles. These were our first sent ones. Yeah. Um, all the way back. I, I believe Adam. All the way down yeah. to, to the people we talked about. Yeah. Because they went out. Yeah. They didn't stay mm -hmm. in the comfort of their... Their Bible study or whatever they they went out yeah and Lot went to a place that was very uncomfortable yeah and and the father saved him because like you said before Abraham's prayers but I'm getting ahead here so yeah. let's back up well well no I I was just reminded actually of something you said that uh, you know I believe that the Lord opens the eyes of the righteous and the scripture actually says in the Psalms that uh, to those who fear him he shows his secret amen and you know when I first came to the Lord this was in <clears throat> give or take September of 2017. I think it was it was either October or November. I'm almost positive it was November. It could have been October though of 2017, regardless, coming up at five five years ago now. I was at church with a couple different people, and there was a, a young man sitting this is a mega church, you know, I mean there's tens of I mean thousands and thousands of people in this church. And there is a man sitting in front of me and like I said, I'm a new believer, but I was already encountering things in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And I see this man sitting in front of me, and he's sitting there, and over his shoulders, I see angels' shoulders. Yeah. And over his, head, I, over his head, I see an angel's head. I see an angel's upper body over this man. Yeah. And I'm staring. I am just completely in awe. And the people that are with me, I go, are you seeing this? And they go, seeing what? And I go, you don't see this. And they go, Nick, seeing what? And I go, oh my gosh. <laughs> and I realized I was the only one seeing this angel. Yeah. I don't even know what the preacher preached that day. I was staring at this angel the entire time. And I had a revelation because there's different angels doing different missions. Exactly. I had a revelation in the Holy Spirit that this angel was not a messenger angel. It was not this, that, or the other. It was specifically a warring angel. I mean, it was specifically a protective angel. Yeah. It was guarding this man and his family. And so afterwards, I said, hey, what's uh, what's your name? And actually, if I'm not mistaken, like, like I said, this was five years ago. I think he told me his name was David. And I said, David, I've never seen this before. He goes, but right now, still, 
there is an angel that is sitting on top of you. And it has been covering you this entire time. Yeah. I don't know what your family is going through, but it's specifically a protective angel. Yeah. The following week at church, and since then, I don't think I've ever seen this man, and before him, I've never seen him. But the, like I said, this is a mega church. And so this, the next week at church, he finds me. And he says, Nick, it is so crazy you gave me that word. He said, my mom lives up north. And my mom was driving behind an 18-wheeler. And she said that a big ice glacier, ice thing, came off of the 18-wheeler on the highway, smashed her windshield, wow. and the glass went all around her and did not touch her. Wow. He said, my mom called me and said, son, I think there's an angel protecting us. Amen. And I told him, I said, it's exactly what I saw last week. But these were things that I'm seeing and I'm getting revelation on, but nobody else around me at the time. No. And not to say that these people are not righteous and this, that, and the other. Maybe the revelation was for me and for my walk. It is. But nevertheless, the Lord doing these exact things today. Yeah. I, I, I want to share an example, too, that we've experienced, yeah. too. Uh, we, we had a house, a house fellowship. And that house fellowship that we had, um, it, it, we had pretty good numbers that, that kept coming to the point that we had to shut it down because the neighborhood was too packed. Yeah. And it was causing issues. But before that all happened, Maria and I were in the prayer rooms praying. And we had a visitation from principalities. And I don't want to get into all that. But that's when the angels showed up. They show up when they're needed. They show up when, it's, when it has to be. And that angel stayed in that house. And it was really crazy. As a good mentor of mine, um, when all of this went down with the principalities, we had actually prayed for a very uh, powerful pastor. who he, he was an apostle. He'd started over 12 churches. And he went out into the streets, and he was praying for the, the homeless, the, the drug addicts, the prostitutes. And he'd build churches, and those people became the leaders of those churches. Then he'd turn it over and go to another one. Very powerful. And he was setting people free. And long story short, uh, a witch had come into his, his church, and he'd gotten to the point where he'd gotten a little bit prideful. And the fact that he'd seen so many demons and stuff being cast mm -hmm. out. And she slid in his hand a chicken bone. That came out during prayer. And the father had us praying some things and we broke off things. Well, these principalities showed up. The angels showed up. I called my mentor in the morning and I said to him, I said, John, um, you're not going to believe what happened. He goes, stop there for a second. What happened at 2.30 in the morning? He goes, I was up pounding the heavens for you. And he says, I want to talk to you today at at uh, the encounter service uh, that it would have been Saturday night. And he says, let's not talk about it until we get there. Well, I get there, and he had a picture drawn of the principalities exactly the way they looked, and he showed me that there was this 30-some-foot angel that had put its wings around me. Oh, my. I'd gone to my knees, and folks, I was up at 2.30 that morning praying. Right when he said what happened at 2.30. Exactly. Morning. Because I went out and I sat at the couch. This was after three days of intense praying. And when this guy came into the prayer room, he said this. He said, um, in three days, if I don't hear from the Lord, if I don't feel his presence, if I don't feel him the way I used to, he goes, I'm either going to kill my wife, divorce my wife. Either way, I'm done with ministry and I'm done with my wife. Wow. This is the first time Ray and I prayed for a pastor ever. That was our first one. Yeah. Nothing like diving in. Yeah. And so there's a little bit of pressure, but I realized real quick it wasn't me doing this. It was him. Amen. And I had to give all the honor and glory to him. Amen. And so through this process, this all occurred. John showed me. He said, what happened between the time these appeared in your living room? Because I was reading the word, and all of a sudden, every hair on my body stood straight up. And it wasn't a good kind of goosebumps. It was nasty. Yeah. And so... I went to my, first I walked over and I was scared. I'll be honest with you. These things were over 10 feet high. Yeah. And they were dark. They, you couldn't see a face and stuff. And I said, in the name of blood of Jesus Christ, and boom, they surrounded me. Just like that. It was like nothing stopped them. I went to my, my knees and I said, by the, the power of the blood of Jesus Christ at Calvary, you were defeated. You have no power over me. You have no power over Jesus Christ. And then instantly they left. John says at that minute, because I explained what happened, he goes, do you know why they left? And I said, 
I don't know. I said, because I had said Jesus over and over and over, nothing happened. He said, that's when the angel put his wings around you and they had to flee. Wow. That angel never left the house after that. And, you know, we'd have people that would come over just to try to see that and stuff, and they wouldn't see it. Others would see it right away. The one that blew me away was my mother came into our house, and there was a spot in our house that was downstairs. Our ceilings downstairs were nine feet high, ten feet high in the living room, and it was crunched over. And that one spot in the living room, I, she just walked right through it, and she stopped right there, and she just started bawling. She goes, what is this? What is this? What is this? Yeah. I said, Mom, there's an angel there. Hmm. And you can't fake this kind of stuff. She no. had no clue. No. But there were people being healed in that house with nobody touching them. It was just so powerful. The, the, the Holy Spirit was moving in such a powerful way. Angels are real. Yeah. I know we kind of segued here a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the fact is, is it's not just for Lot. It's yeah. not just for Abraham. It's not just for Joseph. It's not just for certain people. It's for everybody in the kingdom. Peter, I mean, Peter had multiple encounters just getting broken out of jail by angels. Amen. You know? But see, there's a lot of people who are teaching today that only that was only for the disciples, and after that, it stopped. Well, the thing is, is that this is what's powerful, is that this brings insight as to, like we said, all these different things bring insight to the scripture in the New Testament as Amen. to why Peter is telling us in 2 Peter chapter 2, he first starts off with Noah, but then he goes on to say, listen, Lot was righteous. Yeah. Lot was sitting at the gates in the midst of a wicked city. What it's actually a picture of is us sitting at the gates, us sitting wherever we are at, and not just sitting in a literal right. sense, but us wherever we are at. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, as Paul calls it in, in, in Philippians chapter right, two, right, and also as Peter says, repent and, and, and be converted from this from this perverse and wicked generation. But it's the same thing today. Nothing's new under the sun. There you go. Whatever will be that. has already been. Whatever has been will be. And so what we see here in the Father's word, it's for us today. And so Lot was righteous because he didn't partake in these sins. Lot did not fear man. Lot was willing to give his life. In fact, he was willing to give anything that he had for the sake of saving these guests that he had exactly the way that his uncle Abraham did in the chapter before. You know, before you get into, before you get into that in great detail, I want to talk about also the people who are under an influence of the Spirit. Because these people are bold. They're bold. Yeah. They have no fear of the Lord. They have no fear of, of, of Lot. Even though he's a righteous man, yeah. um, there's no respect. There's nothing. In fact, they want to take the angels, these men, they call them, out so they can have sex with them. Yeah. Right there in the city. Right. And they want to just have their way. And then Lot says, take my virgin daughters instead. And Well, and you know what's interesting about, about this is in the book of Ezekiel, it actually gives us sins that Sodom and Gomorrah did that we don't necessarily see written explicitly in the scripture. However, we do find them in actual uh, extra biblical literature. But in Ezekiel chapter 16, starting in verse 48, it says, As I live, the word of the Lord, Sodom, your sister, she and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters did. Yeah. Behold, this was the sin of Sodom. So we're about to hear what the sin of Sodom was, why God destroyed them, in which case will tell us what Lot did not do. And it actually tells us the things that he was doing that pleased the Lord. And so it says here, this was the sin of Sodom, your sister. She and her daughters had pride, an abundance of bread, peaceful serenity, peaceful serenity, and she did not strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty, and they committed an abomination before me. So I removed them in accordance with what I saw. And so notice he gives this, this he's saying, okay, they're gluttons, yeah. they're prideful, they're haughty, idle. But, no, idle. but notice he says, they did not strengthen the hands of the poor and needy. This was exactly what Lot was actually trying to do. Yeah. He said, hey, come to me. I'm going to feed you, take care of you, stay with me for a night, then go out in the morning, and they're forbidding it. Yeah. And so these are all things in the midst of his generation where it was, it, 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 was, it was seen as him being righteous. And you know, this was actually interesting. 
when I was living in downtown Houston in 2017, I ever since I came to the Lord, I always had a big heart for the poor, as I know you and Maria do. Okay. I always had a big heart for the poor. I would give any of my stuff for the, you know for the poor. In fact, I've I've given plasma screen TVs. I've given this, that, and the other. But I was living in uh, a nice high rise downtown, and right outside of our high rise is a big homeless community. Yeah. And so everywhere I go, they knew me and Kaya, my dog. Because we were out there every single day, and I would sit on the benches with the homeless people, and I would just hang out with them every day. Well, I actually ended up bringing the homeless people. I, you know, I used to just bring them out whatever they needed, food, this, that, or the other. But it got to a point, finally, where I just said, listen, just come with me up to my apartment. Well, whenever I was bringing them up, like I said, I was living... Your, your parents do this, too. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my parents have had homeless people literally stay with yes. them and even watch their house while we've That's been awesome. gone because we built such close yeah. relationships with them. Yeah. And so, you know, I've learned this, these things from my parents, but I'm living in a high rise. And like I said, it, it, it's a high rise. So many, many wealthy people are living there. It's a very, very nice place. And after I bring these people up, one of the security guards approaches me from the, from the high rise says, Nick, you can't bring these people here. <laughs> I said, why can I not bring these people here? And I said, what is the difference between that man, a poor man that's living on the street, and that man right there in his suit? Other than the fact that he's wearing a suit, what's the difference between them? In fact, James even says, listen, if you favor this rich man, have you not done a wicked thing? And I said, I pay rent here just like everybody else. Do not ever tell me who I can have as my guest and who I cannot. This is the stuff that I mean when I say Yeshua himself says in Luke 17, the end of days will be like the days of Lot. We're going through the same exact thing where, listen, Sodom did not want Lot to be hospitable. Right. At the time, they didn't want me to be hospitable. Right. People have not wanted you to be hospitable. Exactly. It's the same thing where the Lord is calling us to shine as bright lights in the midst of this generation Amen. and be righteous ones in the image of the Messiah. Because like you said from Hebrews 13 too, we never know who we're actually stewarding. We never know who we're serving. In fact, the proverb says, when you feed the poor, or when you give to the poor, you give to the Lord. Amen. Amen. I've told you this story before, and we were at an actual a prophetic conference. Yeah. Now, you would think in a prophetic conference with all these believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who are there because they're God-fearing people, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that they would accommodate the homeless person. We actually were on our way, and I had my mentors there with us and my, my whole family, and we were on our way to go get a bite to eat. And as we walked past this place, there was a homeless man sitting in a doorway, and he had aftershave lotion that he had poured through bread, and he was eating, drinking it for the alcohol. And uh, I asked him, I said, hey, uh, can I get you something to eat? And he went with us, and, and we paid for his food and everything. We were sitting there talking. Come to find out, this guy was a professor at a university, and he was a concert pianist. And he had had a traumatic event happen. His wife was killed right in front of him. Wow. And it, it just, it pushed him over. Yeah. He couldn't handle it. Well, the father told me very clearly to, to take him to this conference. And so I did. I, I brought him into this conference, and I sat him next to where I was sitting. And these people came back. There was two seats that were empty next to us. And he sat right there. And, and he smelled like the streets. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. And the people next to me were like, oh, I can't believe you brought him in here. I said, I thought this was a Christian event. <laughs> it's one thing when it's a manager of an apartment yeah. who may or may not know the father. Right. But here you are sitting here. But here's what happened. This totally... Um, it totally blew me away because the guy that was doing this, like, he, he wrote the book called The Seer. And you can look him up. Wow, yeah. Okay? He's well known. This man gets up on stage and the father, I could tell the father was speaking to him. Yeah. Because he was sitting there in that zone. He turns and he goes, there's somebody in here and his name's so-and-so. And he says, the father wants you to know this. He was talking to the guy next to me. Yeah. And the word that he spoke just hit this guy right between the eyes. He turned to me, he was in tears, and he said, thank you so much for bringing me to this. He goes, I got what I needed, thank you. Wow. Got up and he left. And it's like, 
I don't, I've never seen this man before. After that, never saw him before that. Was he an angel? Was he, you don't know. Yeah. But the very fact, it was so important that the main speaker that night, and there were 5,000 people in this place. Yeah. He called this man out. It goes back to that verse where it says, even the sparrow, the father doesn't let him fall, or it doesn't fall without him knowing. Yeah, yeah. And how much more you. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're a homeless person and, and you have no hair on your head. He still knows the number of hairs you have on your head. You still have a calling. Well, I've, I've mentioned before, I said, you know, Second Corinthians, I think it's chapter 11, discusses, in, I'll say in decent detail because we don't have the full picture, in decent detail, uh, the best detail that we really have in the New Testament of Paul's sufferings. He says, shipwrecked, I've been in the sea, I've been in prison, I've been yeah. in fastings, I've been naked, blah, 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 so on and so forth. Well, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, no, I'm sorry, in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, listen, um, unlike y'all, I have no permanent home. He was from the South. He spoke y'all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says, unlike, unlike y'all, I have no home. He goes, I wander from place to place. Yeah. And Jesus says the same exact thing. In John 1, two of the disciples of John the Baptist, one of which is, is Andrew, Peter's brother, they come and try to follow him. Peter said, or Yeshua says to him, what are, you, what are you wanting? They go, where are you staying tonight? Come and see. That's what he tells them. But he says in the book of Luke chapter 9, he says, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. In fact, he, he had nowhere to lay his head from the time he was born. The hotel didn't even make room for him. And so one of the things that I've said before is, would we even recognize the Messiah today? No. The Messiah dwelt in many cases, I'm not going to speak always, but in many cases amongst the poor and the homeless. Now we also see him being with the rich, with Zacchaeus and so on and so forth. He was with all people. But nevertheless, the scripture is very, very clear that he also dwelt amongst the poor. Yeah. And yet we're not stretching our hand as much. And I'm not going to say all people because there's plenty of wonderful people that are doing Amen. incredible things for, for the poor. But nevertheless, it's something to always keep. I'm not going to say in the back of our mind. I'll say on the front of our mind is these are some of the main principles yeah. as to why Lot was considered righteous. And Yeshua was giving us a hint and saying in the end of days, listen, there's certain things that were going on in the days of Lot that's going to go on in your days. One of which is a major one, taking care of the poor, being generous, you know, these different types of things. But obviously there's there's other main themes such as, you know, Lot not partaking in the scenes, sins of his generation, sitting at the gate, willing to be hospitable, sitting at the gate as Proverbs 1 says, and preaching repentance, preaching righteousness, saying, hey, come and learn the ways of the Heavenly Father. Right. Be converted, have faith, and give your life to Yeshua, so on and so forth. Amen. And, I, you know, anytime that we start... If, if, if we're not keeping Yeshua at the center of stuff, yeah. we're, we're in error. Yeah. Because everything from the beginning of the book, and it even tells us that he was there in the beginning when everything was created. Amen. It was through him. Amen. Amen. Because he actually is Yahweh come down as, as flesh. Yeah. And when we say Yeshua, we're actually saying Yahweh is salvation. Yeah. So he, you know, that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. A cod. But my point is this. When we get to a place where all we want to do is is study just the word and not do anything else. In other words, the thing we have to ask ourselves, and it was pretty cool because Marie asked me the other day, she goes, you've been really putting in a lot of time studying. Yeah. And she goes, so what are you getting out of it? And I love it. I love Maria because she always, she always pulls more out of me. Yeah. She always kind of, you know, so what are you getting from all of this? Yeah. And I said, I'll tell you what, it's filling the, it's overflowing and, and it's, it has to go out. Yeah. And that's how it should be, is what are we learning from this, and how are we going to project this, or what are we going to do with this? Are we just going to store it up and keep it? Yeah. It, it's kind of like this. If Noah and his family had stayed in the ark and never come out of the ark, yeah. what good would have that been for anybody? Right, right. They had to go out. Yep. If Adam and Eve had stayed in the garden, yes, they sinned and so forth, but there wouldn't have been population on earth. There was no kids born until they came outside of the garden. This is my thinking. I could be wrong. But what, I, what I'm saying with this is we have to take what we get from this in our experiences, the encounters that we have, 
and share those. Yeah. Some people get upset and they're like, well, why are you talking about those things? You shouldn't talk about those things. No, that's part of our testimony. Yeah. And nobody can take that from you. If you can find it in the Word of God, Amen. it's worthy to be talked about. Yeah. In fact, it even says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, it says, Let him who speaks speak according to the Word of God. Amen. Everything about the Word of God needs to be discussed. Everything about the Word of God is worthy of study. Peter, uh, Paul even says to Timothy, listen, all spirit-filled scripture is worthy for rebuke and instruction and righteousness, so on Amen. and so forth, to make the man of God complete in every good work. But no, this is, this is really good, Todd, because it's these types of things about law. We just took a character that we get some information on, but in the narrative itself about him, starting in Genesis 12-ish, going through you know, chapter 19 or 20, we don't get all of these in-depth things, especially as it pertains to him being called righteous Lot and what all is brought into that. And so I really like how you started out saying we have to explain what righteous is. We, then we go back to Noah and we see the one that is first called righteous in Genesis 6. And we, we bring up Proverbs 1. We bring up Ezekiel 16. We bring up all these different passages from the Tanakh and from the New Testament and we actually get a fuller picture of an identity of who this man Lot was and go, wow, he's not just righteous because Peter said it, but we actually see why he was righteous. We get to learn from this man. And this is so much of what we can do with the scripture, which we can do so much about Noah, which I would love to be able to just do a, a segment just on Noah. Yeah, that would be awesome. You know, but this has been, this has been really, really impactful. I, I thank you so much for this. I, th I thank you too. And I, I just want to make sure that we don't leave this part of it out because, yeah. you know, the fact that um, Lot, as Abraham did, remember Abraham said, hey, if there were 50 righteous, would you still do this? If they're right. all the way down to 10, Lot does the same thing. For the town, it, I, I believe it's pronounced Zor, Zor. Yeah. And it means insignificant. <clears throat> the name of that is insignificant. It, it's this little tiny place, but it's one of the five cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it was to be destroyed. So he pleads for this little place, and it becomes a place of refuge for him. He, again, learned these attributes from Abraham. Yeah. He's duplicating what he's learned. Right. But even through all of this um, righteousness that he has, and this is a question I have and something we can go into depth later. But you see that his oldest daughter has children and the youngest daughter has children. They got him drunk with wine and they wanted to take his lineage on. One was the father of Moab, where uh, Balak comes from. And the other one is the Ammonites, yeah. who we learn about later in the Word. And so... They weren't so righteous necessarily. And we see that with other characters in the Bible, like Hezekiah, who was very righteous, and then his son was the worst king ever. And why these things happen. But that's a story for another day. Yeah. No, but one thing I do want to close on, just because, like we said, yeah. we, we always want to make sure, number one, you know, these, these segments are so great because, you know, there's, there's one, you know, there's time for, for preaching yeah. and, and bringing the power of the Holy Spirit and, and, and doing the things that the Lord needs to do in those moments. And then there's, you know, these times where we're sitting down, we're able to just talk about the Word of God, the way yeah. somebody would sit down on the couch and, and, and put something on the TV, they get to watch something, you know, with the Scripture and this, that, and the other, is keeping it so much about what it tells us about the Messiah and what you had said about how, you know, just closing it with how Lot was seen as a righteous man, but the Scripture tells us that because of Abraham's prayer, God remembered Abraham's Amen. prayer, and therefore, there was more favor upon Lot. Yeah. And it reminds me of things in the New Testament, like with Peter, where Yeshua says, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you, and you will return to me, and you will strengthen your brethren. And it's the same thing for all of us, is that, all of us who desire to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and become true disciples of Yeshua, the enemy wants to sift us. Yeah. But Yeshua is sitting at the right hand of the Father, the book of Hebrews says, and that he is being our advocate and he is interceding for us. 
And it, no matter what we do, it is because of him. Just like it was no matter what Lot did, it was because really of what Abraham was doing for him behind the scenes exactly. that he didn't even see, yeah. that he didn't even know about, that he found this favor because of the covenant that he made with Abraham. The same thing goes with us is that no matter what we do, it is because we have somebody that is interceding on our behalf and bringing redemption and favor to us continually as we abide in him. Yes. So I think that that's a powerful picture of the gospel right there. Amen. I, I think it's important too that maybe some people listening to this who don't have even a personal relationship yeah. or anything yeah. uh, with Yeshua. And I, I really want to say this. You know, you mentioned that he's our advocate. Yeah. If you can imagine a courtroom, yeah. a courtroom you have a judge and you have attorneys. He's the best attorney that a man could ever purchase. Yeah, amen. But the thing is, is he's free because he's purchased us. Amen. He paid the ultimate price for us. Amen. He gave his life for us. Amen. And if you don't have a personal relationship with him, I can tell you this, um, I was disgruntled with the church. I left the church at the age of 14. And uh, when I met my wife, um, shortly after that, uh, I was arrested for drunk driving. And I ended up getting a deferred sentence. I wasn't proven guilty or any of that. But I spent a night in jail. And I ended up, because of a, a homeless man that I had uh, bought a beer for, wow. he actually wouldn't let the police put me in that jail cell. I thought he was an angel after that. I really did. Uh, later, I preached at the, at the Mission of Hope, where a lot of homeless people are. And I had a guy come up to me and said, you know, he died at a bus stop. He froze to death. And he goes, I know who he was. And he was a, an awesome man. You never know when you do something for somebody when it's going to come back and protect you. Yeah. And it did. Long story short, I remember laying on a concrete slab, looking up, and I said, God, if you're real. Now, I didn't accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. I made a deal. <laughs> I bargained with God. And I said, if you're real, don't take my wife. She wasn't my wife at the time. But don't take Maria from me. I promise you there's good in here somewhere, and I promise to serve you somehow. I made a vow. It was a year later I gave my life to Christ. And I'm going to tell you this, it lifted a ton of bricks off my back. It was until I, that was 19 years old when I did that. I was 33 when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I've had people say, Todd, that's not theologically correct. And I, yes, it is. In Acts, there's many places where people had gotten baptized in Jesus, or John's baptism, they call it, but they'd never heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Paul prays and they're baptized. So I just pray this. If, if you're listening to this today and you would like to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would encourage you, this is just the first step, but just come and, and kneel on the ground or go lay on the ground and just say, Heavenly Father, I, I choose to repent today for sinning against you. Yeah. Father, I thank you for your son, Yeshua, for the stripes, the whippings that he took upon his back for my healing and for the crown of thorns that were placed upon his head for the healing of my emotions and my mind. And today, Father, I choose for you to be my Lord and Savior. I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. And today, Father, I choose to forgive those who've hurt me. I release them to you. And in the name of bloody Yeshua, and by the power of his Holy Spirit, I command every spirit of unforgiveness to leave now. I command every spirit of bitterness to leave now. And any manipulative, controlling spirit of witchcraft, I command it to be gone. And Heavenly Father, I choose you and you alone. Amen. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. And you know, I would like to uh, just end the prayer that we would also rise up as these lost amen. in this generation. Amen. Let's do that. Father, I thank you so much for your word. And I thank you for my brother Todd. Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. And Lord, in the name of Yeshua, as Yeshua said, Father, that the end of days will be like the days of Lot. And Peter says he is righteous, Lot. Yes. 
and he was hospitable. He was willing to give of his bread to others, even if it was his last loaf. God, give us this heart that he learned from Abraham. As Galatians says that we are sons of Abraham when we come to the faith. Lord, may we have this heart of Abraham. May we have this heart of the Messiah. Yes. Raise up many righteous lots in this generation yes. to be redeemed and to be saved by the precious blood of Yeshua and to be filled with the Holy Spirit to preach righteousness yes. at the gates. Yes. That no matter who comes, Lord, we do not let them despise us or trample upon the words that we speak, but with the power of the Holy Spirit and with all authority, may we speak your word. As Proverbs 1 says, crying out in the streets, saying, all of you simple ones, all of you who are living in sin, come to the Father. Yes. Repent. Yes. So, Father, I just thank you so much. I thank you for everybody listening. And I thank you for my brother Todd in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, thank you, brother. All right, thank you. You're good. Well, join us again on Spirit and Truth. And next time, I think a good topic would be Abimelech. Abimelech would be fun. Absolutely. Let's do it. All right. All right. God bless. That was really good. I think it was good. That really flowed. Yeah. I liked it.